By the way, social media has been awash with reactions to that Maradona story. Let's get let's read a couple of tweets before we move on to the bench. Deputy President William Ruto here in a tweet earlier on said the football world has lost arguably the greatest player of all time. A legend, Diego Armando Maradona, was a genius, supernaturally creative, with sublime skills that personified a golden era in football. Mm. Former Prime Minister Raila Odinga, Diego Maradona inculcated the love of soccer in millions of people across the globe, turning the game into almost some kind of religion. He inspired the youth onto the pitch. May he rest in eternal peace. Lots of tweets. Governor Hassan Joho, County 001, says Diego Armando Maradona united millions across the globe through soccer. He lit up our TV screens and stadia with every game that he played. He inspired millions across the world with his finesse and his charismatic personality. You will be sorely missed. One more. FKF Chairman Nick Mwendwa, or President Nick Mwendwa says, rest in peace, legend. You defined a football generation. You lived football and the world will honor and remember you forever till we meet again. Let me ask my guest what he thinks of Diego Maradona. Dr. Mukhisa Kitui, Anktar Secretary General. Good to see you, Dr. Ari. Hello, good evening. Uh, Jeff, Asante, Asante. Your thoughts on uh, Diego? Uh, Diego was a gifted footballer, uh, definitely uh, part of the, 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 the stardust about him was the humbling he gave to Britain, uh, the, the, the England, during the World Cup in Mexico in 1996, mm -hmm. the hand of God and the genius goal. Yes. But also because he played in premier European leagues, like Barcelona and Napoli. Yeah. Because I think that the all-time greatest footballer is uh, Pele. Still, still the all-time. Pele is the all-time all great. I agree with but you. So, uh, we, we celebrate a, a genius who got under the weight of a celebrity status yeah. and went into substance abuse. Yeah. Um, but, 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 but still, he was a gifted genius. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> I like that, gifted genius. Mm -hmm. And a colorful but checkered career, if you will. Checkered, not so much checkered career, but checkered character, personal history. Character. He played very well, but you see he has been struggling. Yeah. He was never a great coach when he coached no, Argentina at the World Cup in South Africa. Correct. It was a very poor performance, uh, but he was a gifted uh, magician with the ball. No doubt about it. Dr. Ari, we're going to talk about uh, so many things. I mean, now that you're in town, we need to utilize that brain of yours. Uh, let's keep talking about soccer. No. Like that. <laughs> Enough of soccer. <laughs> about BBI, the other soccer that's being played. Uh, that's what? not as interesting as, uh, the, uh, as the Argentina and Maradona saw that. Let's soccer. take a break. Come back. Dr. Mohisa Kitu is my guest. He's the Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Anta, he's also former Trade and Industry Minister. Remember, during Kibaki's time? And he was there when we promulgated the Constitution. Keep tweeting. At Quinanga Jeff, at Citizen TV, going to the hashtag JK Live. JK Live takes a break. We'll be back in a short moment. Stay with us. And welcome back to Jeff Koinange live here at Citizen Television. My guest today, live in the studios, all the way from Geneva, Switzerland, Anktad Secretary General Dr. Mohisa Kitui is in the house. By the way, Dr. Arik, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Again, you have a big fan. Manu Chandaria, 91-year-old, is watching you right now, as I'm sure half the nation is. So, Dr. Arik, you were part of the 2010 Constitution. You were that. You, you were there. Mm. And you remember that. Today, yes. they started a signature signing event mm. that will lead to amendment of the Constitution. Why should the Constitution be amended 10 years later? You were there. No, I mean, the, the thing is that there are a number of different things. Every new Constitution has what we call the, the hardware disease, that there are certain things you could not anticipate their consequences, or there are some inconsistencies in the Constitution that need to be addressed. So properly structured, the first 10 years of a new constitution is a good moment mm -hmm. to reflect on whether it has served you well, whether it could have been done better, and in a structured way you can start process of uh, improving upon it. But I don't know if BBI represents a structured reflection on the hardware sicknesses of the 2010 constitution. Mm -hmm. um, BBI is not the normal building consensus on what are weaknesses of the constitution. In fact, 
I, I, I have problems with BBI as a constitutional document because uh, uh, more than 50% of it is not constitutional stuff at all, at all. Uh, much of what you're talking about is uh, policy issues. If you want a fairer society, mm -hmm. if you want more inclusion, if you want to tone down uh, strife, uh, those are not constitutional issues. Uh, like I said uh, recently to another forum, I mean, if some uh, political leaders from some communities have been insulting each other every time we're going to have an election, you cannot cure political bad manners through constitutional amendment. <laughs> Next time, the, the lawyer and the Tesla will be insulting each other. Do we have another constitutional amendment to fix it? I think those are issues that are not constitutional. But I think more importantly, you, you are seeing a rolling exercise that you consult, people are discussing, and then we change this today. Tomorrow we'll add more MPs for this area, try to keep everybody happy. Uh, that's no way to be fixing a constitution. I think BBI has its own benefits, but it's not about a consolidated reflection on the weaknesses, if there are any major ones, and cures to the flaws in the 2010 constitution. Mm. Okay, you mentioned the TESO, and, and you know, that's a good point, because one specific amendment or a specific point of this uh, BBI, mm -hmm. expansion of the executive, providing five positions, president, prime minister, deputy prime minister, or two deputy prime ministers, and a vice president. Come on, well, this to appease what? Big five, is that what you call it? Why? Is it necessary? Uh, you know, I, uh, I have not uh, participated in the constitution making process for obvious reasons. Um, my position has not allowed me to be so deeply embedded in the issues of this country, particularly on the architecture of the new constitutional order. But I can say as a citizen of Kenya, as a patriot of this country, if I have a little more money to spare, I will not expand the political bureaucracy. I will deal with the most urgent issues of the moment. The ravages of the economic disruption by the COVID. I will look at how to rebuild the services industry, how to breathe new life and hope and opportunity for the vulnerable who have been victims of economic contraction because of COVID. I think that will be a first thing for me. Secondly, I don't think that the weakness of our constitution has been because we did not have enough jobs for big boys. Uh, if, if, if you look at a situation where you have uh, 42, 43 ethnic communities in the country, a plurality of the leaders from majority ethnic groups cannot say that it is national stability to assure them perpetual presence in high office as, we, as a share of public leadership. It inherently tilts the equation against the many ethnic communities that are minorities by the numbers. But most importantly, we can look at how to keep big boys happy, but it's not the priority of Kenya in the midst of the pandemic right now. Doctor, you mentioned the pandemic, and you saw the story I just read earlier on where uh, Treasury Cabinet Secretary Ukuri Otani says the economy may shrink by 1% this year. Uh, that, that, that's our, our, our World Bank projection. Correct. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the Kenyan economy is not unique to Kenya. A lot of economies are shrinking, and we know the dynamics that are informing this. We know the disruptions of global supply networks. We know the disruptions of export dependence, particularly at a time when many countries, major destination markets, are focusing much more on uh, localization of supply chains, and therefore disrupting the supply opportunities for many developing countries. Mm. We know about the severe hit on the service, uh, hospitality industry and the transport industry. So these are realities we cannot run away from. Uh, the impact on small and medium businesses, the jury is still out about how deep is the, the hurt to the, to the economy. So I, I'm not in any way surprised. And not all of this is to be blamed on government. A lot of it is just that we did not have cushion and resilience in the face of a global pandemic. Mm. If you are on this side, and r looking out, rather than on the outside looking in, yeah. Doctor, how would you fix some of these problems? What, what's the quick? I don't think there are any quick solutions, but I think there are two, three things that I'll, 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 I'll give emphasis to. Mm -hmm. When you take your eye off the ball of the pandemic, people think that the pandemic is behind us. We should not compete for space with COVID. At this stage, you should see how can we make Kenyans know that this constant 
phenomenon. This pandemic is still with us. I know the Ministry of Health has been doing quite a bit, but the political elite should not muffle their voices on COVID because of a desire to make points about the BBI for or against. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the vulnerable need empathy. People who are taking out mortgages and are struggling to service them, people who are taking loans to, to, to buy new vehicles for tour, uh, game tracking are seeing the collapse of the, uh, the, 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 the tourism industry. People who are invested in the hotel facilities are seeing a shrinking of uh, the, 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 the clientele massively with no clear recovery in sight. I think a collective statement of empathy, a commitment that we want to address this as best we can will be very, very important as part of a national conversation at this moment. Secondly, unlike countries which have the luxury of a uh, stimulus package and helicopter money for the poor, subsidizing wages for people who are not able to do their jobs, our economy does not have that capacity. A statement of solidarity, whenever we can afford it, cannot be putting a foot wrong. For example, if it takes 14 billion shillings to carry through a referendum on BBI, and I had 14 billion shillings, I'll use that money to pay for the cost of COVID testing for everybody, instead of asking everyone to pay their own COVID testing and I do a referendum. I think it doesn't send the right signal of empathy with the most urgent problem of the moment. Mm. And the third, we have to start addressing again. C recovering better has to start even in the midst of the, of the pandemic. We cannot wait that we'll have a cure, vaccination, then we start talking about recovery. And what does recovering better mean? What are the new levers of our enterprise Kenya? How do we put enterprise at the center of national renewal? How can we make Made in Kenya competitive again? How can we reverse the declining competitiveness of Kenya vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors and as trading uh, nations? So these are questions we cannot turn away from. Similarly, I think we must find a little space to worry about circumstances in our neighborhood. We have seen uh, the nature and trends of elections in Tanzania. We are seeing happenings in a very important, in fact, the most important trading partner of Kenya in the world, Uganda. Mm. How well it manages transition eventually is going to be of great importance to Kenya. We are seeing rumblings of the unraveling of political f ethnic federation in, in Ethiopia. Mm. To the moment, it may be Tigrinya, people running away to the Red Sea Hills district in Sudan over 60,000 already gone. Mm. But if ethnic federation unravels in Ethiopia, at a time when we've just completed building a tarmac road from Addis Ababa to Nairobi, you should be ready to expect 10 million refugees. Are you making the preparations for it? Are we preparing the Kenyan population for these possibilities? Are we raising the flag to the rest of the world that a solution to Ethiopia is a collective solution to everybody, but particularly important for her neighbors? I think these things should not be put on hold because we're discussing how to distribute positions between paramount chiefs of tribes. I don't think that is a, 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 an appropriate thing to do. Are you saying that's a possibility, Dr. Ari? 10 million refugees crossing the border, of, in, you know, with Moyala on that? Mayala Ethiopia Subaru? has 110 million people Correct. and counting. Right now, the crack line is between uh, TPLF, who retreated with the most military material mm -hmm. and the generals to Tigray yeah. after the, the coming into power of Abe. But the rumblings have not been confined there. There's still friction in the structure of an ethnic federation, which has limits in African context of how it can work. Mm -hmm with an assertive central government. So if those problems we're seeing to the north can be replicated in other parts of Ethiopia, it can become a phenomenal challenge to Ethiopia's neighbors and friends. And I think we ha don't have to wait until it happens yeah. before we start paying attention. Absolutely. Good point there, Dr. Ari. Good point. Let me come back to your, uh, your points about COVID. Did we drop the ball? Could it have been handled differently here? In, in I don't think I want to apportion blame. Mm -hmm. Uh, Honorable Mutai Kagwe, the Minister for Health, uh, CS uh, Health, is a friend of mine and I've been sharing my views about the challenge with him fairly regularly and candidly. Mm. Uh, in many ways, I have always said that Kenya has handled the, the COVID pandemic much better than countries like the US. 
um, thanks particularly to the Kenyan population that you tell them some of these things are just no-go territory and by and large they obey this. It has been helpful. Particularly in a society where there is no public subsidy to the unemployed. So we have done fairly well. But I think the point is we are not out of the woods and we should not take our eye off this challenge because we want the exciting uh, theater of political contest. Mm. You were talking about uh, <coughs> development priorities, Dr. Tari. Did we get them wrong? Um, I, I cannot just do a, a, a full-blooded uh, audit of uh, our, our development priorities, mm. but I, I, I have a sense that post-COVID economy of Kenya and the whole world is going to be very, very different from where we were before. Some challenges in the global dynamics like the flow of foreign direct investment were pre-existing problems. Stagnation for a decade since the last global financial crisis. And where we are now, we are past a tipping point. Where we are now, we have to construct a new economy with some levers that were not there before. For example, the opportunities of servicification of manufacturing, the growth of digital economy, the possibilities of building an ecosystem of net entrepreneurs as a major new force in, in services industry are areas that need public support. And I think Kenya can seize those moments. I'm very glad that um, the Minister of ICC uh, 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 has uh, we have just signed an undertaking, an agreement with uh, the Kenya government that UNCTAD is going to do for Kenya what we've done for Egypt, Lebanon, Iraq, and uh, Rwanda, which is a uh, help to craft a national digital economy policy. And we, I very much look forward to us engaging on what are the new possibilities? What are the new areas where limited public resources could return optimal uh, benefits, particularly in creating employment for young Kenyans. I'm sure Manu Chandari would share this frustration. Why, hasn't the manuf why isn't the manufacturing sector growing? What more can be done? Um, manufacturing is at the core of any national revival. No country can evolve into an industrial society without growing manufacturing. Unfortunately, it is true that uh, we have been having a, a steady decline of manufacturing as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and uh, I very much appreciate the president's uh, emphasis on manufacturing as one of the four pillars of uh, his priority program. Uh, but my sense is that um, there are a number of things that still need to be done. We must address the question of manufacturing from the perspective of how can we make Made in Kenya competitive? How do we enhance uh, innovation and technology absorption into the production process in Kenya? Why do some countries coming far from behind Kenya catch up and build innovative capability, competitive, manufactured value added than Kenya? Why does Kenya still import bicycles from India? I shared with some people that when the Khmer Rouge were driven out of Cambodia in 1989, they left a country shattered with less than 200 university graduates. Fast forward to 2018, mm -hmm. Cambodia was exporting 10 million sports bicycles to the European Union. Oh, we must start asking ourselves, what is it they're doing right that we're not doing? And, and speaking of which, Dr. Ari, look, remember the days when coffee, tea, Pyrethrum, mm. cotton, mm. well, big ex exports, Kenya exports. Yeah. What happened? What happened? Uh, tea, tea is still a big export for Kenya. And I think there's some lessons we can learn from tea, which uh, should apply to some other sectors, particularly cotton and coffee. Mm. Uh, coffee, the liberalization of coffee was not properly managed. And uh, personal interest from big players really disrupted the cushioning of the producers. Until now, in net terms, we are seeing a very dramatic contraction in coffee production in Kenya. Yet we still have some of the best Arabic coffee in the world. Yeah. And the potential for us to expand that as a livelihood is an area that requires a lot more public attention and state support. And you know, this is one of the reasons why, if you asked me that we are to look afresh at our constitution, 
there are some areas I will feel very strongly about. I will de I will reverse the devolution of health and agriculture. You know, there is no model of a developing country which developed the agricultural sector without structured state subsidy. And you cannot have a properly comprehensive structured state subsidy for agriculture if you have devolved agriculture. So the solutions to Kenya's competitiveness through research, through structured affirmative action for the most vulnerable, through diffusion of technology for better productivity, cannot be done through devolution of agriculture. So some of the things on the economic end that if I wanted to reverse mm. looking at 2010 constitution, I will say the portfolio of agriculture, the portfolio of health should revert to the national government. This is my sense. Similarly, uh, we have to rethink how much export processing zones and the textile export under AGOA are being beneficial to the cotton industry in Kenya. Mm. You know, because the cotton industry starts with the producer, looks at the spin offs from uh, cotton, from cotton seed, the cotton keg to the cotton flint, mm. the cotton lint, sorry. And how do you turn this into yarn, into textile for export? But the ease with which you have covered companies operating EPZ, exemption from local value addition, that they continue importing canvas from Eastern Asia, cut, stitch, package, and sell to America as Kenyan export, is not a model of growth. I regret because I walked the streets of New York and Washington with the Kenyan textile exporters to seek a waiver on the, this value addition. But it has created a complacence which has had the possibilities of growing local value addition. Mm. I think the future of the textile industry lies in looking at it as the cotton industry. Go back to the farmer and let the product we export be as, as a downstream product of an integrated development program. Mm not just quick fix, cut, paste, and export. There have been attempts to revive Kikomi, Rivertex, Thika Cotton Mills. Remember those back in our day? I know. I, I donated uh, Rivertex to Moi University when I was minister in the hope that they could use it as a learning experience to create competitiveness and revive it. Yeah, but I also know of successful examples. Uh, Bedi Enterprises of Nakuru mm. is the most integrated uh, textile company in, in this region. Uh, growing cotton in Uganda, yarning in uh, ginger, and, and, and making uh, canvas in Nakuru to produce jeans and t-shirts for the American market. Mm. The more we do that kind of thing, the more we integrate East Africa, the more we create upstream jobs for the Kenyan and East African populations, the more we are industrializing through the textile market access. All right, Dr. Ari, when it comes to food security, Kenya remains very food insecure. Yes. Importing a lot of our food products. Mm. What happened? Where did we go wrong? There is no silver bullet. Uh, again, the conversation of a comprehensive food security strategy is, is, is necessary. We've been going for years since independence. I don't think we've gotten it right. If you look at one reality which has been always upsetting me and I talk about it, the colonial ministry of agriculture was geared to incentivize white settler farmers mm -hmm. to come to Kenya in order to pay for the cost of colonial administration, including the construction of the railway. So you saw agricultural policy was to subsidize large-scale farmers in their competition with the African small-scale farmers in order for them to keep happy and keep coming and growing in Kenya. Fast forward to 2020. The colonial arithmetics that a large-scale farmer gets subsidized inputs so as to have advantage over the African small-scale producer still exists. If you register your farm as a large-scale farmer today in Kenya, you buy inputs at a lower price than if you are a peasant. Whose economy is that? If the small-scale producer is the one who creates employment in agriculture and he pays more or she pays more than large-scale farmer and the Minister of Agriculture pretends that it is working for lifting the peasant, are we playing games with ourselves? It's just, just one example among many 
of the areas where we need very radical transformation. Whose agriculture are we trying to develop? Whose agent is the Ministry of Agriculture? There's a huge food system summit next year. I'm sure you're part of it. We we'll talk about building back better. I mean, the, 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 my narrative has, uh, over the past few months uh, has been about what does it take for us to build back better? Mm. How will we recover from the challenges of an overwhelming demand with a shrinking revenue base? These are questions we cannot run away from. And I think these are questions that are going to be very, very important, even for political stability in vulnerable countries. Mm. And then again, when it comes to manufacturing, power production becomes unaffordable. Power itself, electricity, practically impossible, unaffordable. Uh, w one of the reasons why Comesa became a very unpopular phenomenon in the Kenyan manufacturing sector is that we opened up Egypt to join the Comesa free trade area, while the Egyptian government subsidizes energy, but the Kenyan government does not. Mm -hmm. And that's why you saw Unilever start moving production of uh, household products that had been manufacturing out of Nairobi since 1945. Mm -hmm. They moved them to be manufactured in Egypt and exported to Kenya under the free trade agreement. So those are challenges we have to face. If we are opening up to neighbors, we have to look at factor competitiveness of our economy. I mean, these are our supplies. As we move towards opening up in a free zone with Ethiopia at our border, we say to ourselves, how do we compensate for the fact that the average wage in Ethiopia is less than one third of the minimum wage in Kenya? What is the ad competitiveness of Kenya that will say we will get ad take advantage when we open up to such neighbors? So looking at pro competitiveness as an economy is our, a national priority and responsibility we cannot run away from. But one of the areas of doing these things is really selectively following again on the blueprint of uh, like uh, Vision 2030, our, our national uh, production agenda that I, I participated in the crafting. We say, can we structure areas of building competitiveness, taking advantage of our unique national competitiveness? Not just a blanket statement or exhortation that we move forward, but saying we must become competitive. Mm. We must address why Kenya exported more manufactured goods to Tanzania in 2010 than it imported from Tanzania and why it has been reversed by 2020. You can't run away from those kind of factors. What about when it comes to alternative energy, Dr. Ari? I mean, there's solar, there's wind. I mean, there is a very interesting direction to move. Uh, the future is clean energy. Luckily for Kenya, Kenya is one of the few countries in the world which have already achieved their Agenda 2030 SDG obligations under the percentage of the power mix that is uh, renewables. But the challenge we have here is the cost of retiring expensive contracts. We still have uh, expensive uh, power on long-term uh, private pu mm -hmm. I mean, power purchase agreements that have not run out, which are not only loading how much power there is, <laughs> but loading expensive power into the grid. When there are companies like Kipeto who are ready to supply cheaper, greener, cleaner energy, mm -hmm. but you cannot take them on board without finding a way to retire the expensive diesel barges that we still have in this country. This is catch-22, it's between a rock and a hard place. Um, maybe not uh, totally, but I think we slowly must find a way of how to create a sunset clause to unsustainable, environmentally unsustainable contracts. And, how and there are ways to do it. Mm -hmm. We have seen countries that have declared sunset clauses because of environmental responsibility. Kenya, with the necessary push, can also start moving in that direction. Dr. Sorry, when it comes to uh, the informal sector, driven by imports from China, this cannot be healthy. You know, the informal sector is a major source of livelihood. And it is going through a very difficult moment right now. A lot of informal sector players are falling up. Some of them never to recover, at least not to recover in the particular business segments they are in. You cannot have a uniform thing about they are being done this way. Some of them actually are dependent on inputs, imports from China. To my mind, 
imports of capital goods that spur productivity is not a negative. It is imports of goods that you could otherwise be capable of producing or a reluctance to invest in building competitiveness in making things that you are importing that could be cheaply locally be pr produced that becomes uh, a, a, a national problem. Yeah? Um, but the, the informal sector is under pressure. How it evolves will depend a lot on, and I'm very glad that um, the Chamber of Commerce in Kenya has accepted uh, 18,000 entities from the informal sector mm -hmm. to become members of the chamber and also to get some uh, limited support from the MasterCard Foundation. But I think in the long term, the sustainability of the informal sector depends very much on a thriving mainstream value addition economy to which they become suppliers. Yeah, it's the same informal sector that feels that it's being heavily taxed overly taxed by you the know, the informal sector only pays uh, indirect taxes like VAT uh, they, they are not into their formal direct taxation uh, bracket but what what I have always uh, thought is that uh, if you confront the informal sector not as an authority coming for tax but as a facilitator coming to make it easier for them to produce and produce better they will be ready to become formal pay taxes and get the benefits of those taxes. Mm. But if the taxman comes ahead of the service man, then informal sector is stifled. It re rejects the invitation to formalize yeah. because of the added burdens that it will have. Yeah, it says uh, it, a lot of them feel that they are being taxed out of business. Exactly. And then there are very many models. I mean, <laughs> a national conversation has to be held. If Made in Kenya is going to be competitive, we have to ask ourselves the proliferation of taxations from national government to inform, you know, indirect taxation like VAT to county governments. You cannot grow enterprise if you do not relate taxation policy with incentives for enterprise, mm. with competitiveness. And this is, this is a challenge that we're going to face if we are going to build back better, yeah. if we are going to raise again manufacturing as a contributor to national economy. Doctor, I want to pick up that conversation, especially post-COVID, whenever that's going to be, how do we build back better? And also, you mentioned regional trade. EAC, there's Comesa you just mentioned, there's a CFTA that you've been talking about a lot, the Continental Free Trade Agreement, and also the new uh, trade agreement, free trade with the U.S. Uh, you're an expert in all of this, Tari. We no, want your I, I'm not an expert oh. in, uh, in any of this, but I have an opinion on some of them. <laughs> That's good enough. Uh, in, no, in let's take a break first. And also, moving forward, and, all, and no, let's not uh, kid ourselves. You are running for president. We know this. We want your thoughts on that. And your thoughts, too. Keep tweeting. At Koinanga Jeff at Citizen TV Kenya, the hashtag. JK Live, what an interesting discussion we're having today. Keep it coming. Take a quick break. We'll be back. In a moment. Welcome back to Jeff Kinange Live here at Citizen Television. Yes, sitting down with Dr. Mukhisa Kitui, Ankta, Secretary General. And someone mentioned, I've been very quiet this uh, time around. That's when you, when you have an expert on the bench. Hey, let the man speak. Dr. Tari, you're the man with the numbers and the statistics at your fingertips. Let's go to regional trade. Yes. Okay? You were mentioning Comesa earlier on, but let's, let's even start at East Africa community. Mm. Look, with Uganda and Tanzania kind of gravitating to one side, are we losing that regional uh, uh, stewardship? Uh, not quite. I say not quite because Uganda remains the most important trading partner for Kenya in the world. Because uh, More than the UK, more than anywhere else? Uh, yes, Uganda's because one. what you export to Uganda is value added. It creates more jobs in Kenya what you export to Uganda than what you export to Britain. And for any country to climb up the ladder, you need to, match, to maximize domestic benefit from whatever trade you are having with other countries. But there's also another thing. Um, regional integration and trading with our neighbors is not an option we can take or reject. We just did a major study which showed that there has been a dramatic reorganization of global value chains, global production networks. Mm -hmm. American companies disengaging from China, many major countries starting to procure trade relationships, inputs into what they manufacture 
from their neighbors or locally, uh, which means that countries which have been having a model, including Kenya, that we identify niches in global value chains where we are suppliers and we in domesticate the technology from that uh, and the innovations and we become competitive. Have to start looking at new configurations. One of the main things is if the continental free trade area did not exist, it will have needed to be created now. Mm. But now it exists. The challenge for us is twofold. One, what sectors are we so competitive that we need to shore them up to increase value from our competitiveness on the continent? For example, Kenyan audit services, Kenyan legal services, mm -hmm. Kenyan uh, financial services, Kenyan uh, telco services are world class. So we say, can we have a structured way of maximizing the benefit of these sectors of the services industry across the African continent? We should not just look at exporting, meaning selling coffee and, and maize. Sometimes we can get so much value in exporting our services that it justifies us importing some of the agricultural produce from the countries to which we are selling those services. So that is one. The second thing is, as a country, we have had a lead period of two decades of learning opening up to our neighbors through free trade areas, through a common market and a customs union in the East African example. What are the lessons learned? How can we domesticate conversation about preparing the Kenyan producer for a larger market? Are we going to be flooded by produce of others or are we creating smart partnerships preparing to be the drivers of value export, value creation through integration with neighbors. This conversation is necessary. What is called a developmental state is a state where government, the public intellectuals, entrepreneurs are in conversation of how do we mutually enforce each other to remain or to enhance competitiveness of our own economy. This is the direction we must go. And for instance, look, uh, when you're looking at uh, a regional Inter integration or regional trade, yeah. Ethiopia seems to be like an, a no-brainer with 110 million people, like you said. How come it's taken so long to engage? Why hasn't it happened sooner to bring in our neighbors rather than go out no, but and bring no, back? No, no, there are a number of things. Um, the Kenyan economy is much more sophisticated than the Ethiopian economy. Ethiopia, but they have the numbers. Ethiopia is starting from a very, very low base. And the model of what's been happening in Ethiopia quantitatively increases, but it starts reading, re reaching certain challenges. For example, Ethiopia still has an Exchange Control Act, which was abolished in 1994, which means that if you invest in Ethiopia, you must apply to government for permission to take your proceeds out. So I when a country has that kind of condition, we cannot totally open up to each other, because it means Ethiopian investors in Kenya can take their profits to Ethiopia, mm -hmm. but Kenyan investors in Ethiopia cannot repatriate their profits. That's a reality. I helped, when I was minister, I was helping Kenya breweries to try to, procure, to acquire a brewery in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And when they were just about to succeed, they abandoned it because of this awareness th that you only invest in Ethiopia if you are exporting what you produce so that you make your profit abroad. Otherwise, you have to go to Central Bank to ask for permission to repatriate profits. Mm -hmm which is not tenable in the modern world. So there are some structural issues that are still there that need to be dealt with. Secondly, Kenya has some of the most competitive, most productive labor in this region. We have to build on that. The hardworking Kenyans at all levels of enterprise, mm -hmm. from fiscal manual labor to intellectual labor, are driving enterprises in regional economies. Some countries know how to utilize that properly including countries like, uh, like, like, like Rwanda. See, how can I utilize them until I've built my own comparable resource mm. to replace them? Uh, we have to start saying, how can we remain ahead of the game? I have visited a little country, not very little country, the country which invented the oil rig in the world is called Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. the land of fire. And in Azerbaijan, there was one thing that really interested me as a Kenyan. They have a sovereign fund of $46 billion. And there are only two things for which they withdraw money from the sovereign fund. One, 
is to give 100% government scholarship for the most clever kids in the country going to the best universities in the world. And the second, the government builds uh, a, a, an incubator for startup businesses. You have a great idea, you cannot have access to credit, government gives you a place where you can grow that idea. Try to get to market. After two, three years, if you have been able to grow it into a viable business model, then you get out of the greenhouse and go into the open economy. If you have not been able, and there's no success that you are improving, then you're told this is not a viable business. In Kenya, young, innovative entrepreneurs you have an idea, you have a laptop, you go to a bank, you're asked what is your credit history? Mm. What security do you have? That question should not stifle the potential of the, the apps ecosystem in this country. And yet so these are the kind of things that sure. have to be part of our national conversation. And they, they still call this the Silicon Savannah. Wasn't this supposed to be? With we are supposed to be Silicon Savannah, but you know, we are 15 years since the proliferation of Safari of M-Pesa. We cannot celebrate one champion forever. The DNA that produced M-Pesa should now be replicating that inventiveness, that risk taking by government that we can give license to enterprises. We don't totally understand, but we try to mitigate the risk of what negatives they can do because that might be our milk cow of tomorrow. That innovativeness is a constant we need. And Silicon Savannah, you know, for like Kansas City, you cannot have an idea like this and keep it in gestation for 20 years. The slow development of Kansas City is the reason why the business incubators, process uh, outsourcing businesses, digital enterprise, e-commerce networks in Kenya are spread in small places around this town. Mm -hmm instead of in a centralized consolidated place. The science park idea is almost running out of relevance because of how much time we have taken to give it priority and resourcing. And it comes back to the point you made, Daktari, Kenya being the regional giant, you know, th there tends to be a lot of complacency. I was in Kigali, and I'm, you've traveled to Kigali many times. I'm just giving one small example. Kigali reminds me of the Nairobi of the 1960s, like a blueprint of Nairobi, clean, pristine, orderly. Nairobi of the 1970s. Looks like we dropped the ball along the way, that complacency of being number one or the big boy in the, in the region. You know, um, first of all, I think uh, there is nothing great about being the tallest among dwarfs. Um, we are a small economy. We are a dwarf. But just that there are dwarfs who are smaller than ourselves. And true, there is something about order and organized society in doing things. You know, every time I'm on a Waiyaki way going towards uh, Kangebi, mm. I'm always wondering, every time now, there are three lanes. But every slow car drives on the right lane. <laughs> every motorbike is absolute extreme to the right. I say, why have these people anticipated that Kenya is a country where you drive on the right and the uh, first cars overtake on the left? And it's, <laughs> The petty little things yeah. that were normal and orderly yeah. beca 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 become a nuisance. But I don't think we are falling back because of this nuisance value. It's useful to have values and ethics and constantly saying structure, order, decency, decorum are signs of a growing civilization. But you know, apart from that, what drives our bigness is to say, how can we build on our strongest assets? A very industrious population, a very, pop a very patient population and very innovative entrepreneurs and very patient people even in hardship. A lot of Kenyans are hurting today. But because we are privatizing it, we don't see how much they're hurting. And COVID-19 doesn't help at all. It's been a tough Particularly with COVID. I, I, I was sharing with some friends who work for, for other UN agencies in this town, how, for example, closure of schools which have been an important place for keeping children in safe hands while the parents are working, has meant that children are left home as parents go to work. And they're being victims of molestation, sexual abuse by neighbors and sometimes relatives because they are in a place where they were not supposed to be when parents are away from home. But it is privatized as if it is the problem of the family alone. 
people suffer the vulnerabilities as if it are unique to them. And this, this is why I say that a more empathetic society, where we just show us that we understand the pain they are going through, and that together we can try to see how can we mitigate this pain, is part of rationalizing ourselves as a nation. And then there's something called mel mental health that's really gone literally through the roof. Yeah, I mean, uh, mental health is a major challenge that has not been adequately addressed. I think we have for a long time uh, em emphasized primary health care or physical uh, health care without sufficient attention to mental health. But the challenges of uh, a shrinking economy, declining employment opportunities, disrupted livelihoods, and the traumas that have been accompanying the COVID health problem, but also the COVID economy. Mm -hmm is compounding depression and other mental health challenges that we have as a country. Yeah, we talked about schools a moment ago, Dr. Ari. January 4th is a scheduled o reopening of schools. Your thoughts, is that plausible? Is I, that I don't know. I am not spending enough time in the country, but when I talk to, 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 to different people and I get to hear about some of the challenges, I say that uh, there is no quick fix of yes or no, but that every decision has ramifications. Um, the health end of the pandemic, I hope, comes quickly to an end with a widespread availability and use of a vaccine. But the economic end of the pandemic is going to be with us for a while. Yeah. And how we structure national recovery, how we mobilize international goodwill, how we fight appetites like corruption which are holding us back is going to be important in solving those challenges. Yeah, does that include the government cushioning parents, especially when it comes to fees and other things, you know, uh, post? I mean, there are a number of things government has done. You know, when the government uh, reduced the headline tax uh, f from 30 to 25 percent, in net terms it means that uh, people are given a 7 percent increase in their takeaway salaries, uh, which was a positive signal of solidarity, but also it spurred more consumption at a time when the the producers needed a market for their produce. Mm -hmm. So smart arrangements of how to cushion both the supplier and the consumer, the producer and the consumer, is going to be important in cultivating the most important engine for the national economic re recovery. Look, Dr. Ari, you know, having said all that you've said, and a man who has held such plush positions in, in the highest of offices, you are the highest ranking Kenyan in the United <laughs> Nations system right now, if, I, if, if I'm not wrong. Um, and you've been everywhere. You talked about Azerbaijan. You've been from, to, from Azerbaijan to, let's say, Zimbabwe, from A to Z. Why would anyone like you, in your position, want to be president? Why? OK, a number of things. The privilege of rising from adversity. I've had a very vulnerable childhood. I've seen uh, anxiety and ethnic fear from the, my earliest days as a kid. Mm. And I've always tried, striven for security for myself, for my children. And then I see this society has helped me to grow through these challenges. The opportunities I've been able to appropriate to a large extent have been cushioned by the Kenyan taxpayer. But then on my journey, I see best practice. As I've gone to 119 countries around the world, I'm always constantly asking myself, what is it they are doing better than us that makes them shine? What is it we could do that could make us better than them? And I feel that my body still has the energy, my, st my head still has the intellectual capacity to make a contribution in answering that question in a practical way. Mm -hmm. What is it we can do to return to our motherland in appreciation for guarding, protecting our vulnerabilities, looking after us? in a way that the next generation will live a less vulnerable life like, uh, than I lived. And I just think that I have a sense of not only a shared empathy with the vulnerable, not only a desire to give hope to the hopeless, but a burning ambition that through Enterprise Kenya, I can be part of the solutions to build Kenya for the next generation. But Dr. Ari, when, when you look at Kenya, and you and I grew up around the same time, so 1966, Kenya was on par with what? South Korea, let's say? Okay. When you go to Seoul today, and you compare, and you must, do you, are you ashamed? Are you embarrassed? Do you say, what, when, when did the rain start beating? Uh, I have had that question asked, but you know, there are a number of things that uh, we should also be aware about. Countries which have had an industrial culture even if they are destroyed, 
have a faster way of rebuilding an industrial base and culture than those which have never had an industrial culture. This is the only way I explain how Vietnam was flattened and Vietnam has had a dramatic turnaround. Let me give you an example. In 1994, Africa's manufactured export to the world was worth 60 billion US dollars, 1994. Vietnam was worth 1.2 billion dollars. In 2018, Africa had increased from 60 billion dollars to 90 billion dollars, 50 percent increase. Vietnam had increased from 1.2 billion dollars manufactured export to the rest of the world to 125 billion dollars. So you can't just say we were at that level. There was a certain production culture and potential productive capacity that just needed reorganization and then unlocking. But we can say, why are we sitting on our laurels? Instead of just saying that those have run on, we have the capacity to demonstrate that an African economy through sound planning, sound engagement, fighting such vices as corruption and pettiness, reorganizing priorities, we can build a competitive modern manufacturing economy. If someone has never heard the name Dr. Mukhisa Kitui, would you say, are you the man for that job? I mean, are you ready to take on that kind of challenge, to take this country in, to that next level? In the increasingly likely case that I will be offering candidature for president of this country after I leave my position in the UN, I think I'll give the Kenyan population reason why I think I'll be the right person for that job. I cannot do it while I still am winding down my international obligations. Mm. But, but I think, I think I'm the first of a set of Kenyans who believe in purposeful Kenya, that we have a sense of purpose. It's not tactic. We don't say one power because we have enough money to make you vote for us. We say we have a reason why we should redeem our nation, that we carry a certain set of aspirations which can turn around our country in a fundamental way not just the tactic of winning power, the purpose for which you want to win power. And when you say, when people, critics say Dr. Mukhisa Kitui has spent too much time overseas, you mentioned 119, maybe you spent a little too much time overseas and you're not in touch with the ground. What do you tell them? Uh, the ground has been around here and it will let me get in touch with it. I believe in constant learning. My experiences and experiences of those who have been here all the time can merge in creating a mosaic of the Kenya we want. Their energies, their enterprise, their hopes have to be part of the chemistry that we work together. So I do not come like I have a civil bullet with all the answers and the Kenyans have all the questions. Mm. I want to lead a sound, structured, positive conversation about where we want to go. I want to be part of a team that leads that conversation, not Kitui alone. There are a lot of others who have been here all the time who will be part of this conversation. Yeah. Nearly 60 years after independence, are we, are we able to do that? Can we take that next major step? I have seen a small country called Rwanda, which was brought to its knees a short 26 years ago. I visited Kigali after the shattering pogroms of 1994. I saw what African men could do to African children and women and other men. And I've been visiting Kigali every year for the last seven, eight years, mm. I see the trajectory of transformation. That country does not have the human resources that Kenya has. That country does not have the natural resources that Kenya has. That country does not have the industrial base that Kenya has. If singular obsession with success can work there, there's no reason why it can't work here. It should work better here. Super and I want to be part of the team that proves that Kenyans can make made in Kenya matter and count. Bottom line, what you're saying is it boils down to leadership. Leadership is an important ingredient. And national, national co commitment and obsession with success becomes part of the mosaic of success. In a society like ours, I'm sure many societies are very similar, but you know, we call it the PhD syndrome. Pull him or her down. It's not about looking at what's ahead. It's how you can... Okay, uh, it is possible to surrender, throw up your hands and uh, say, we have been terrible. In some ways we've been terrible. We have wasted opportunity. Mm. We have abused privilege. We have hurt our own country's international standing many times, but we have no right to give up. 
for posterity, we cannot afford to fold up and say, well, that is their character. The character that is holding us back can be fought by the power and the force of those who believe positively that the God who has endowed others with the dynamism that has led them to evolve has also given us that ability. And just the challenge to us is how do we unlock the potential of Kenya mm. to greatness? And sure. I think that it's there. Sure. Uh, well, you know, one more negative negativity that we thrive on. Some people say we get what we deserve. No. I have seen societies getting nasty solutions, but then they, they say this is not what we are. And I think when I see corruption, I, I believe that this is not what Kenyans are. We have experimented uh, with that idea that if everybody steals from everybody else, we'll all get rich. Mm -hmm. And we have found that it's the most nonsensical thing you can think about. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are ready to move on and say in a structured way, I'd rather you grow my enterprise than steal from me and give me some of what you have stolen. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That's a good point. Makes you want to say, hmm. Let's look at some tweets, Dr. Ari. Coming in thick and fast. Kalu Leparillo says, Dr. Musa Hitui, is that pair of safe hands? Why doesn't he unite with Musali Mudavadi, Ekuru Aokot, Alfred Mutua, and others to pump new alternative energy to our politics? The two opposing camps, pro BBI and anti BBI, are pulling this country apart. I try to talk to everybody who is ready to listen. I have not created for myself any political enemies in Kenya. I very much want to engage and I talk to the different persons being suggested. And I hope that we can have a national conversation, which is not about tearing the country apart, mm. but about finding common ground in building enterprise Kenya. Are they listening to you? I mean, do they engage? Are there you? are very many who are listening. There are others who are frightened by ideas that they are not comfortable with. <laughs> That's fair enough. Glimmer says, I have followed Dr. Mukhisa Kitui for a long time, and he is, my, in my opinion, the best. Will he give the presidency a shot? We need clean hands. Well, you alluded to that. You're still working for the United Nations, you say. But, you know, that window's still open. <laughs> Jenga Afro says, what does he think of a third world country shutting down its night economy for nine plus months instead of looking for other solutions to contain the virus? Uh, I have looked at more advanced economies and they have not found any other solutions to contain the virus. The pandemic requires certain painful sacrifices, but we can mitigate some of those sacrifices if we are in certain ways being careful, following science, mm. following informed advice, but doing the right things. What about when they say sometimes Kenyans, you know, there's that, we're tired of this business, we're tired of this, enough already. You are tired, you, are, you have had enough of this, what do you want? Ask Trump supporters what they got when they were tired with the following science. <laughs> Winter Douglas says, what is the future of trade in Kenya, Dr. Mukhisa? Where did we go wrong? Would we say that our full throttle trade liberalization, especially in the 90s, killed our trade inwardness and our capabilities? You know, we look at lessons of the past to inspire our solutions for the future, mm -hmm. but we cannot afford to be stuck in the past. I cannot say let us make Kenya great again by going back to 1980s before structure adjustment. Structure adjustment has come, we pour the blunt of it, now we say, Having paid this, made the sacrifice, how can we now get the gains? By selectively saying, what are the levers of competitiveness in a liberalized market? And Kenya can ride that liberalized market. By the way, the free trade agreement with the US, it's being crafted as we speak. I don't think it is. I, uh, I am one of those people who have been uh, telling Kenya government, please hasten with caution. Mm. The desire of President Trump was not because there was something big he wanted out of Kenya. He wanted a model agreement which he could use to kill multilateralism by telling everybody, you want post Agoa partnership with America, you must do a bilateral agreement like Kenya has done. It's my hope that uh, President Biden is going to change the rhythm and give an assurance that collectively, US will engage the African members of the continental free trade area in an improved, modified Agoa that caters for the interests of Africa growing its exports. So, not a multiplicity of bilaterals. Right. 
So renew at Goa after 2025 or 26, yes. but in a bigger way. Yes. Huh. We're already engaging Congress about uh, working on a reformed Agoa, compliant with the provisions of WTO, but also knowing that we want, as Africa grows into a, sh a shared uh, business community, economic block, negotiate with us as, as, as a block. The way U.S. negotiates with the EU, it does not negotiate with Germany or Italy. It negotiates with Brussels for the whole of the European Union. And that's the direction that we have to go. Okay, what about the recent free trade with the UK? You know, Britain is unique in the sense that Britain has ju is just coming out of the European Union. Since 1972, this is the first time that Britain can negotiate a free trade agreement with anybody. But fundamentally, we should understand the British priority is going to be about its market access into Europe, which remains the most important trading partner for it. So politically, it is good to start saying, does it affect our exports to the European Union, to Britain? But Britain has set the benchmark that they are key. The body of rules and customs of European Union trade with Africa are going to be the foundation of British trade with Africa. So what we saw in the multiplicity of showing engagements mm. is crafted very well, same way as retaining the status quo as Britain was in the European Union. Mm. All right. Engineer Lazari says, Dr. Kitui, kindly explain to our ordinary Kenyans the consequences of our nation's foreign loan appetite and the danger of not paying back on time. It is true that uh, the trajectory, the direction of growth of public debt in Kenya has been worrisome. Uh, today, Kenya's public debt is about 63% of GDP. That is bordering on stress areas. It is not comfortable to say you can service this comfortably. Mm. Even before the pandemic arrived at the start of this year, already 40% of Kenya's public revenue is spent on servicing debt. It's not a model we can sustain. We are starved of resources to spur economic growth if we have to spend so much in servicing debt. So we have to get a point at a point where we say we have to be more judicious in how much we can borrow mm. because this generation has no right to bequeath the next generation with unsustainable debt and humiliation. Basically, that's what we're doing. We're mortgaging our children and our grandchildren's futures. We can do that if we do not rein in the appetite for new debt. All right. Matunda Nyanchama asks, asks Dr. Mukhisa Kitui his thoughts about the issue of land. With everyone wanting a kaplot, the entire country will soon be little plots with little land left for food production. Well, nice to hear from Professor Nyanchama, who is a very active member of the Kenyan diaspora in the U.S. Uh -huh. and a coordinator of Kenyans in the diaspora for many years. Mm. Uh, it is true that we have this unique national fetish for owning land, which sometimes gets absurd and uh, we are converting a potentially productive asset into a, 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 a residential facility. You have seen how we have lost the Kiambu yeah. from agricultural country, some of the largest coffee producing area, into uh, mortar and, 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 and iron sheets. You know, um, this direction and even the miniaturization of peasant holdings it's taking a production of those puzzles while people get security that they own land. I think we have to start addressing afresh when can we limit how much land can be subdivided for it to remain commercially viable. I'm going to give you the last word here, Dr. Ari, as we wind up. What would you say would be your greatest asset to move this nation forward? You, coming from the outside, if you will, what would be your greatest asset? You know, the earliest memory I have as a human being comes from the time when I was about three years old, before independence. I was born on the slopes of Mount Elgon in a place called Chuele, Kibichori near Chuele. And one evening, we were rushed out of our home. We had a grass-touched round hut that was our house, and we were all asked to carry things quickly and go to hide them in the forest. And we walked more than two kilometers with my parents, with our neighbors, to go to the closest house which had iron sheets. 
because word had been spread that Sabaoth warriors were coming to burn Bukuzo houses. The fright I had seeing my father frightened, my father running away like me, seared a sense of vulnerability in my memory that has refused to go away. And all the time I've been obsessed with this. Can we have a society where no kid fears that the home is going to be burnt down overnight? Can we have a society where the sense of fear and vulnerability is behind us? At the personal level, I've been able to strive above it. But I sense the sense of vulnerability that I learned from that, my earliest experience that I have in my memory, mm. has always driven me that public service should include addressing the vulnerabilities that are so diversified in our society. I think that sense of empathy, that belief that I have an idea how others have done it better, and not just outlandish ideas. I've seen it done under the Kibaki government when I was here, mm -hmm. when I was minister. And I have seen some things done by President K K Kenyatta as well. But I just believe that from where I sit, I have the energy, intellectual experience, and networks within this country of goodwill, which together we can be able to build on the foundation laid by those who are in power today for the next level and taking the challenges of tomorrow on board. But time is ticking, isn't it? Tick tock, tick tock. The time is moving. Action is taking place. Do, do we have a window, though? Is there a window where we could turn this thing around? Kenya will turn around. I'm an optimist. I believe in this country. I believe in this country's people. But I don't think we need to go further down before we turn it around. I like the, the reconciliation in the air, particularly the effort led by the president and the former prime minister about uniting Kenyans, riding out tensions, sanitizing political rhetoric, that the leaders of large communities should not be trading uh, political insults as part of the 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 the, 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 the the, 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 the vocabulary of political competition. I think these are important steps. But can we now build on to those arrangements which address a proper exchange rate between politics and economics? After six years of Kenya's economy serving Kenya's politicians, I think it's about time the politicians start serving Kenyan economy. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the direction we must move in. Yeah, during Kibaki's time, remember the economy grew from what? Uh, up to 7.1 yes. going into 2007. Mm -hmm. So it's possible. It is possible. And you're ready, are you up for the to the challenge? I think we are up to the challenge. Dr. Mukhisa Kitui, always good to talk to you, my friend. Good luck. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. And um, let's keep talking. And thank you very much for the generous words that I've received from so many Kenyans around the country mm -hmm. and in the diaspora through the, the tweets that came through. Thank you very much. Eh? And see you again. See you again. Dr. Mahisa Kitui, folks, Secretary General, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, based in Geneva. He has an outpost looking in Kenya, but now he's on the ground. As I'm sure a lot of you have, uh, have listened to what he has to say kind of leadership that we need going forward as a nation at the end of the day it's up to you thanks so much for being a part of jeff kunange live every wednesday it's all about those three letters on the keyboard that follow each other j k l thank you for being a part of the show good night good luck god bless kenya well done